welcome. Welcome, everyone. And I'm going to share my screen now. Um, for the new participants, I would like to remind that, that the meeting today is part of a project identifying and countering Holocaust distortions, lessons for and from Southeast Asia, implemented by the Never Again Association and supported by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and uh, Henrik Bjell Stiftung Cambodia and other organizations. The meeting today is organized in the series of online meetings for museums, memorial sites and civil society. And as we are a very diverse group again, uh, and we want this meeting to be as interactive as possible, I would like to invite uh, everyone to share your name and your country on the chat. And uh, please uh, stay muted during the presentation. And at the beginning, we will have a presentation for around 30 minutes. And afterwards, uh, we will have a time for uh, Q&A sessions, for discussions, but also please, uh, you can comment, um, uh, you can post your comments on the chat during the presentation. And the meeting will be recorded. And after the presentation, please raise your hand if you want to comment or if you have any questions. Uh, during the meeting, we will discuss how we can look at contemporary genocides and what are the challenges in telling stories of today, right now, uh, when the history is happening uh, more or less before our eyes, and how we can avoid distortion, denial of certain facts, how migration to digital space can impact the narrative, storytelling, how we can create this narrative, and what are the main challenges. And the meeting is very interesting and important also for us because also within our project, uh, identifying countering Holocaust distortions lessons for and from Southeast Asia, we are also planning a digital exhibition in several languages. So, uh, and we are very honored um, to have our speaker today and our speaker will be Sarah Lombard, who is the director of museum experience and digital media at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which has a lot of experience in the field. And Sarah Lombard leads museum storytelling telling across the museum digital and physical spaces. And here innovative story, um, here responsibilities include setting vision and strategy and overseeing the development of new innovative storytelling experiences. Uh, recent new experiences include the in-person and online exhibition, Burma's Path to Genocide. The museum podcast, 12 years, but shook the world and imaging the museum online resource, the Holocaust Encyclopedia. Uh, Miss Lombard came to the museum uh, after five years uh, of work at NPR, where she led strategy across the news, programming and digital divisions. And she also uh, has also lit health lead product and business development roles at Webscom and Washington Postcom. And she holds an MBA uh, from uh, Instituto de Impresa in Madrid and BA degree from uh, Pomona College in Canada. So, dear Sara, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen with you all. And... A minute, things are moving around here. Hold on. All right. Can you guys see my screen? All right. Yes. And you can you can still hear me. Okay. Um so first off, a thank you very much for having me. And um, as you've heard, I work at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. I've been here for almost seven years. And uh, I'm gonna share with you the challenges of creating an exhibition about the, that we've titled Burma's Path to Genocide. And uh, we had lots. So I'm gonna set the stage. I have some questions for you and please, interrupt me, like ask questions. Uh, I think a presentation is always helpful to guide the conversation, but it's not the only thing we're doing. So in case you didn't know who we are, um, we are, um, we opened in 1993 
and we are America's institution for the documentation, study, and interpretation of the history of the Holocaust. And we serve as the US's memorial to the millions of people murdered during the Holocaust. So I said the Holocaust a lot of times, and that's really important because most people think of us as being known for the Holocaust. It's our area of expertise. It's what we collect around. It's what we study. It is um, what we've created lesson plans for. We train police officers about what their role in the Holocaust. So that's a lot of Holocaust, but we also do, we focus on never again. And so that's work for victims of the crimes of mass atrocities or genocide or where warning signs are today. Doing for others, potential victims, what the world did not do for the Jews in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. Um, our work has included working in Bosnia, Cambodia, China, Iraq, Rwanda, South Sudan, Syria, just to name a few. I left out a few places. Because as you all know, never again is not a reality. Um, so just talking about today specifically, um, in July, 2018, we decided to tell the story of the Rohingya. We would do that in an online and in-person exhibition. In May, 2020, two years later, um, the online exhibition opened, and then a year after that, in May 2021, the in-museum exhibition opened. This was a journey. It included a government shutdown. It then included COVID. And then, as you'll hear about some of our, those, um, those were challenges we could deal with because uh, the rest of the world was dealing with that. But we also had to learn a new history. Our expertise is the Holocaust, and I want to share more about that and what that meant for us. Um, we also had to learn a lot from our visitors about what did they understand about Burma. And um, the biggest challenge is living with the responsibility of telling a story like this that is challenging and making sure that we didn't get it wrong. Okay. So this is our agenda. It's really light. Why this story? I've kind of talked about that. I wanna share with you what we did so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, and then the challenges. And I'm figuring we have six key challenges, but you all wanna interrupt and talk about that and go to breakout rooms, whatever works for you. And, but before we do that, again, interrupt, ask questions, raise your hand, use chat, all those great things that, um, that are allowed. But before I proceed, knowing that that's what I was planning to talk about, um, in addition to what Raphael challenged a moment ago around confronting denial and distortion and the Southeast Asia focus, are there any other pieces that you guys want to make sure that we talk about or that I discuss, that I touch on, anything? So I don't want to bore you all. I want to make good use of everybody's time. Anybody? Okay. I heard something. All right. I'll continue on and um, see what you think. So. Um, has anyone checked out the online exhibition? Anybody? We have a chance. It's beautiful. Um, we built it in-house. This is what it looks like. And it has, that's the image on the left. It has four, three components. One is the history. And the other one is personal stories. We knew that we needed to tell the history. And then we wanted to tell personal stories to create the connection to the history um, history can be dry facts, but it's the people that make it real. Um, that's certainly what we found in telling the history of the Holocaust. We got this a little wrong, um, and I can explore why. I'll just tell you up front, 
What we found over and over again is that Americans know so little about Southeast Asia, Burma, Myanmar. Um, we chose to go with the title Burma. Um, that unlike telling the history of the Holocaust, where people spend a lot of time with personal stories online, Americans have spent most of their time with the actual history. That's not what we expected at all. And we also have a section. So we've got, as you can see, the history section, personal stories. You can go back and forth between the two. And then there is also a teaching section. So teaching resources, which have been used. And then we made sure that you can actually print out the exhibition. And we can talk a little bit more about what it means to do an exhibition online, especially if you want people in Southeast Asia to have access to it. So we did that online, setting the stage here. And then the other piece that we did, of course, was in museum. It's on 730 square meters. It's three rooms, each room, yeah, three rooms plus an entrance and an exit. And we chose it and it's told in three, in three chapters. The first chapter is the life before, and we start with the in, um, actually, we start with independence because we needed to establish the role of the Rohingya in Burmese society and then the decline, the movement from citizen to outcast. And in it, oops, I think I know how to do this. Come on. This is the beginning. And then in it, we weave through personal stories. And you can hear the story, each of these people throughout, they're very different. They have very different experiences of what happens through, through uh, in the history of Myanmar. Our second room was specifically 2017. It is the violence that forced hundreds and thousands of people to flee. Uh, a visitor can spend a minute here, they can walk through or they can sit through the entire film, um, how it stops and starts. It's individual stories. It's amazing photography to really immerse our American visitor in what happened in 2017. And then our third act was life after. And it is by the way, the only room in which you see the perpetrators of 2017. We made sure that they did not have a voice. Everything that you have seen is from the voice of the Rohingya. We thought that was really important. So I wanted you to see what we did. And then well, I can show you more about that. I wanna to talk to you about all the challenges that we had to create something like this because there's so much that we didn't know. And I think this is what you want for anything you do. And this is all true for both online and in the museum. So this is our first challenge um, was focus. It's true for any exhibition, but for the Rohingya, we argued about what we wanted our visitor to take away from our online exhibition and our in-person exhibition, agreeing that it had to be the same thing. And um, this became our guiding light because we want to tell huge stories. We wanted, we wanted our audience to like know everything about what was happening in Burma and what happened to the Rohingya and all of the historical, um, the history. We talked about colonialism, like we went way back. It couldn't be everything. So we had to agree to two things only. And that meant that when there was a new element that someone wanted to add to the story, we have to say, does it, is it gonna add to this, to these two takeaways? Or is it gonna detract? And we just went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for two years. And these really, this was our focus. So I would say, as you all are creating an exhibition, um, or learning resources, lesson plans, anything, make sure you know exactly what you want your audience to take away. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. 
Got it. Uh, our next challenge, and this is specifically a US challenge, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it means to do things for a multiple audience, is what did our visitor know about Burma or Myanmar or the Rohingya or citizenship? Or what is genocide? Um, so we interviewed 28 visitors in small groups to ask them those questions. And um, they don't know where Burma is. They haven't heard of Burma. They haven't heard of the Myanmar of Myanmar. They certainly haven't heard of the Rohingya. Um, so, okay, that really, we wanted to talk about what happened in Burma. And then we realized, oh no, we like, have to talk about what is Burma. Like we wanted to have a story that was like, we wanted to start here, but our visitor needed us to start in a whole different place. So we did. Um, and we really have to explain who the Rohingya are. Um, and we really have to make the Rohingya people, uh, not a Muslim minority in a foreign country, that those aren't people, that's like a, a designation. Uh, so that is why we incorporated personal stories throughout really looking to bring the Rohingya to life and their experience to life. And, the, and the, like the Jews of the Holocaust, there isn't one experience. Each person is having a different experience. So, okay, that's gonna change how we're gonna do this exhibition. And then we wanted to understand when we say you're gonna lose your citizenship, what does, an American think that means? Like how much do we have to explain about what it means to go from citizen to outcast? Uh, here we were really pleased because Americans responded with answers like lack of um, access to education or healthcare, uh, physical insecurity, economic insecurity. Like, all right, that's gonna go okay in terms of how do we tell a story and making sure people see that it's also, it's a process, it doesn't happen all at once, which then takes us to genocide and mass atrocities. We wanted to know if when our visitors think of genocide, when they hear the word genocide, are they thinking of an event or the, do they understand that it is a process? It doesn't happen all at once. And you all know this, it happens, the, Stages set bit by bit so that by the time there is mass murder, we've all seen it coming or the potential for it coming. And our visitors understood that it's a process. So that was, um, that was really helpful. Questions, anything? So based on that, and this is one of the ways that we work, but we also tested everything with our visitors as we were really looking to make sure that they did walk away with those outcomes of understanding that the Rohingya were citizens and contributing um, members of society in Burma. And so we tested everything along the way. Um, we tested our images. We have a lot of audio clips. We tested those, we tested video, we tested the maps, and then we made changes. Uh, we wanted to make sure that in our map, they understood, they would look at it. Maps are really hard, by the way. They would understand where Burma, Myanmar are. For images, we tested images by laying them out on a bench, giving people a paragraph of the introduction to the exhibition, and asking them to select the images that really match the text that they were that they were reading. Some of the images that we loved and wanted to include completely confused our visitor from thinking that a refugee was a guard overseeing a camp. Well, no, no, he's stuck in the camp in Bangladesh. Um, it's like, okay, we need, we still use the image, but we changed its placement and we provided uh, 
context. So we tested everything. We got so much wrong, but we got it wrong early when we were designing the online experience and the museum experience. So images that we loved didn't make it. Um, images that we thought were good did make it because they really resonated for our visitor. It's a very humbling experience. But at the end of the day, it makes for an excellent experience. And we're really looking to honor, we were looking to honor the Rohingya and the history of Burma and what happened there and where we are today. So anything that we can do for that. Um, it looks great now. I have to say it, at the moment, we would argue if we really needed to test things. No, 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 you don't need to test that. We were wrong. Okay, so those are three challenges but gets worse. It's not our history. We're the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. We know the history of the Holocaust. Um, we have contacts in the community. Some of you have been to our museum or you've worked with our scholars in Mandel. We know the history of the Holocaust. It's highly unlikely that we're gonna make a mistake and we know who to reach out to, to vet our work if we're talking about collaboration and complicity in France, a recent exhibit that we did, part of a recent exhibit that we did. What do we know about Burma? So we needed a storytelling partner and we found Greg Constantine. All the images, most images that you've seen are his. He is a photojournalist. He had been working with the Rohingya community for 10 years. He'd been studying the events of Burma firsthand, not only been to Burma, he'd also been to Bangladesh. And his images and recordings became the foundation of the exhibition. And throughout our work, he was continuing to go back to Bangladesh and to Burma and, um, and adding materials. He also had contacts, which became really important later because, I'm just gonna the second slide, which is really related, which is this other challenge. How do we make sure we got it right? And getting it right, when we do something around the Holocaust, we also, we wanna make sure that we are respectful of the, the victims and the victims are a large, not a monolithic group, we were respectful of the victims. We didn't do harm. So the community itself, how does the Rohingya community see this exhibition and the work that we're doing? Thanks to our partner, Greg, and also museum colleagues, we were able to reach out to members of the Rohingya community and have them come in and take a look at what we were doing along the way, not at the end. Um, we usually have our own historians review our exhibition scripts, both for online exhibitions and for in-museum exhibitions. We don't have any in-museum historians who are experts in Burma. We have people who work on policy who know a lot, but even they were like, they're not gonna, um, they didn't feel comfortable. So outside historians who we paid, none of this was volunteer. Um, and then to ensure that as there are other communities in Burma, not just the Rohingyas, you know, for them also to react to what we're doing to ensure, to understand their perception of how we're putting forward the history of Burma and the history of the Rohingyas um, communities move from citizen to outcast. And then what I will say also, I think this is my last slide, about the, Oh, there's, there's one more, but um, because we didn't know the history, our entire team, both for the online exhibition and for the in-museum exhibition, uh, had to read uh, several articles and one book on Burma. We used Francis Wade's book um, and then several articles that were provided to us so that they would understand the history and really begin to have an anchoring in the history of Burma and the plight of the Rohingya. 
that they naturally have because of their work in the Holocaust. And there's one last piece that was really unexpected, which is distance. Um, I know the history of the Holocaust, much of it, and it's a really hard history, but I also know when I need to protect myself, when I need to step back. Um, so I can create a distance. I don't get, this is true for everyone on the team, we don't get surprised by the Holocaust. It's well studied and, and, we, and, and we've worked with it for a long time. This history could sneak up on us. It's contemporary. Uh, some of the, we, we needed to take a break. It's a really hard history, uh, especially contemporary events that are like a mix of the Holocaust. And if any of you have studied uh, the Jim Crow South, there are lynchings of Black Americans. Some of what has happened in to the Rohingya, it, um, it beggars description. And we just had times where that team needed to take a break from photos, from the history. It was really hard and unexpected. And in all of this, one of the, we have all these challenges because what we're trying to do is make sure one, that people care, history is real, and that they understand the history. Southeast Asia for Americans is really, really far away. And Cambodia, that was in like the 1970s. That's history for many of our visitors. We don't talk about Cambodia. We don't talk about Burma and Myanmar. Um, Vietnam War is a distant thing. So it's a real challenge. It's not distortion that's a challenge for us. Actually having people even be thinking about Southeast Asia. Again, our focus has been the US audience. Online, it's certainly the inter international audience. We've seen people accessing the website from, from Burma, Myanmar, from Bangladesh, from Germany, from France, all over the world, which is one of the fun things about the web. Uh, and for that, I would say for the web, we made sure, we attempted to make sure that the website works really well on phones because we knew that, from, that for the Rohingya community, that's probably how they would be seeing this, especially um, the hundreds of thousands of people who were in refugee camps and also that it would load very quickly on their phones. So they wouldn't be waiting for three or four seconds for one page to load because that's not accessible. That's just frustrating. So those were, those were our biggest challenges. I'm happy to unpack much of it. Uh, so with this, uh, Raphael, you asked about confronting denial. Here in Burma, Myanmar, like we're so far from even talking about denial for the general public. We're just talking about it exists. Um, and that Southeast Asia is a place that we should be concerned about, which is kind of sad that, you know, there's this ocean between us and the two oceans between us and the rest of the world. Uh, and then I'll say just a little bit about Holocaust distortion and denial, at least in the United States, hardcore denial is not where we spend most of our time focused. And I think this is now becoming true for other countries as well. It's the distortion. It's, oh yeah, it happened, but it wasn't that many people. And, you know, uh, so we work on distortion. And the other piece that we focus on or that I worry about is that the history of the Holocaust is, is um, getting in time, it's just becoming further and further away from us. And while it, um, 
sadly, as everyone on this call knows, there have been many genocides after the Holocaust. It's a very well documented genocide. You can really look at the process and the warning signs, and it has so much to teach us that its relevance is um, unending. And that's the part we want to keep, I want us to keep, and we're trying to keep front and center is the relevance is unending. It doesn't matter that we started with the Weimar Republic in the 1930s and 1940s, and soon that's going to be 100 years ago. Uh, there's lots that it can teach us and apply to today. And some people don't think that anymore. Maybe they never did. I don't know. That's my last slide. So we are open for discussion. There's one more slide, but there you go. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and happy to send out this presentation to anyone who wants it. Thank you, thank you very much, Sara. And I think we already have several questions on our chat and uh, I don't need to read it, maybe. Um, the first question is coming from Alona. Uh, from the museum. So, Alona, would you like to ask a question directly, please? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, actually, uh, I have questions about uh, the visitors you have, the visitors you have online and offline, which audience you were expecting? Is it different from what you got? And do you have any statistics about uh, your online visitors? Are they coming back to your website? Uh, to, to this uh, information, or they are just coming and never back. It happens sometimes. Oh, it happens a lot, actually. Um, so the majority of our visitors come just once, and they spend anywhere from, on the online exhibition, they've spent anywhere from like six, a minute to 14 minutes. We love those 14-minute people. Uh, and that's kind of what we were expecting. Uh, it is teachers tend to be the people who come back multiple times. So they're using it as a resource. We hope, yeah, we hope that people would come once and spend a lot of time. And we assumed that online, we get one opportunity to have an impact and that's it. Maybe someone will come back because they read something interesting. Maybe they'll recommend it to a friend. Maybe they'll share it, probably not. Uh, but that was, that was our assumption. And I can actually, I'll bring up the actual, um, as we're talking. Uh, in museum, this is so sad. I mean, we opened during COVID. We were ready to open, gosh. I don't remember when. I mean, we were ready to open way before May 2021. It's just that COVID was happening. So we didn't get any people. And we still haven't been able to observe people going through. Right now we have somewhere between 70 and 100 people going through every day. Um, that's because our museum capacity is limited to 800 people a day. So we haven't, we haven't done... Uh, we haven't yet done visitor observations to see what we got right, what we got wrong. The one thing we did do was, um, part of this is an audio exhibition. So we, we have looked to see where people are listening and we moved a few things around to see if that changes people's listening patterns. And what we learned is it, it it is the position of certain images. It doesn't matter what you put there. That's what they're going to listen to. So we've learned that. Um, and the museum visitor is, we know our museum visitors. We did some surveys uh, three years ago, four years ago. The museum visitor is the person who's coming to Washington, D.C. to see the museums. They're not coming because of the Holocaust, they're not coming because they love history. Um, does anybody here use TripAdvisor? Yeah, TripAdvisor, Yelp, yeah. Well, we have really high ratings on TripAdvisor. That's why they come to the museum. It's like, oh, they're gonna go to the museum, they'll include us. And then after that, they'll go to air and space and learn about astronauts. And then after that, 
They'll go to natural history and learn about dinosaurs. That's our visitor. Uh, and the online visitor is slightly more committed and interested in this history. Um, what we liked about online though, is that for people who are really interested, it's gonna be a smaller group. Um, one, they can spend more time and two, we can link to other resources. So for the person who really wants to know, um, maybe we'll make a difference for them. Maybe we'll make a difference for a policymaker who's thinking about Burma. And um, when COVID lets us, we're also hoping to have policymakers to do specific programs that are targeted to US policymakers for them to see what's happening in Burma. We hope we can make a difference there. That was a really long answer to your question, Alana. Did I, did I touch on anything that was useful to you? Uh, actually, I was also interested uh, uh, about these people, if you know, they are grown-ups, they are Americans, they are tourists from worldwide or whatever. Uh, when you were, um, you know, making this exhibition, which people you were supposed to see? Who are the main uh, subjects? That's a great question. So yes, our target audience is American ages 18 to 30. That's who we built for. Um, yeah, that's who we built for. The concept of citizenship is one that we've seen really develops over, it becomes very well formed by the time someone is 18, 21, certainly as you become as old as all of us are on this call. Uh, it's really cemented. Uh, building for 13 and 14 year olds there, we really rely on teachers to, to provide a framework and context. Um, and part of that is just where kids' brains are. Uh, they start off being really close to first, you know, their family when they're five and seven, and then they have their sort of neighborhood community and their school community. And that concept of starting to think about group, your larger group, and then ideally your entire sort of if it's your nation or your clan, but really expanding the definition of self, that's, it, it requires people being older for that. So we tested with, oh, I love that you use the raise your hand function, Sandra, I thank you. Uh, really looking at that age group and we write for that age group and we test with that age group. And by writing, I mean, we make sure that, um, I don't know if you have this in other languages, but we look at the readability level. And um, for anyone who's read Hemingway, Hemingway is considered to be really simple sentences, subject, verb, object. We're looking to write simple sentences so that we can talk about something that is really, really complex. We don't want language to get in the way, which as academics and museums, sometimes we write really, really long, complicated sentences. And that's really hard for someone who's been standing on their feet for three hours in our permanent exhibition, and then it's gonna walk through another exhibition. And online, it's the same thing. You're on your phone, you're on a bus, you're on a tram. Like people for the most part are not reading on, on their desktop. So that's part of what we looked for and, and built for and tested with. Thank you very much. Yes, it's amazing especially about the young people who are visiting the museum. <laughs> yeah. Sanjay, I think, did I get it right? Sanjay? Hi. Oh, it's a really nice presentation. Yeah, it's very really nice Thank to meet you, you Sarah. Uh, actually, I'm wondering that, do you have any types of that uh, agenda or like uh, you are making awareness uh, through the museum or any kind of work like, the, uh, you know, in awareness to the, US government or European Union something, you know, about the, this crisis. So are you doing any, you know, uh, for your museum, or do you engage any activities? Like about, we all know that about the, the plights of the Rohingya community, as we all know. So is there any kind of um, agenda or any works, you know? Um, can you be slightly more specific since uh, there are so many crises going on with the European Union at this particular moment. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I mean, through this museum exhibition, you know, through this exhibition. So 
are you are you i mean uh, you know conducting any activities like uh, that make award to the us senate hall or you know european union that you know there's something going on the genocide or for something like a relocate this 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 people is there any kind oh, of okay know, i understand yeah. Yeah, yeah so um let me repeat back what i think you asked which is in addition to providing educational resources around what is happening, what has happened and what is happening in Burma um, and, and frankly, Bangladesh at this point, um, are we doing additional work to assist in the relocation of refugees? And the answer there would be no. Where we see ourselves is providing information so that people who are doing that work have a place to point people to and say, this is what's happening. This is how we got here. And frankly, this is also how we've gotten here for other potential atrocities. There are there were so many warning signs um, in the 60s, especially in the 70s, when we're talking about um, the changing definition of citizenship for the Rohingya, the new citizen cards, losing their land. Um, the list just goes, actually, the list just goes on. So we sort of stop at this line and hope and and make people aware of the resources that we have. Like there's some prayer that goes into that too. Oh, thank you very much, Sarah. And I have, uh, if you don't mind, I have another inquiry. It's just, I'm just curious to know that, uh, and uh, about the materials that, that you are using for this exhibition and this museum. So it just, I'm just curious to know, do you keep any kind of uh, photography or any kind of historical materials that uh, the South or Southeast Asian perspectives of this uh, Rohingya, Rohingya communities? Is there any kind of anything that are available there? We, we wanted to provide a lot more perspective. Um, we do with personal stories. So throughout the exhibition, we have, and there are more personal stories, by the way, online. Um, yeah from Rohingya who are there. And we chose a variety of ages, professions, genders, um, and really looked for one person who had been an adult in the 30s and 40s and 50s, someone who really remembered what it meant to be a citizen, not someone who their entire life, as they remember it, they have been an outsider. So we looked for those multiple perspectives to inform our visitor and to have them share their stories. Uh, and really, I think the most heartbreaking is, is the, the two stories from older gentlemen who were, who remember what life was like before. So that's how we looked to, to address that. I hope that answers your question. And online, I think we did a good job. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, it's Bye. a great question. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Sanjoy and uh, Sarah. I think uh, there are already uh, two questions from Sayana, sir, from Cambodia, and one question from Vietnam, and then Anna and Rafael. So maybe we need to start with Sayana. Sayana, would you like to ask directly? Yes. Hello, yes, Sarah. Yes, I would like to know about the uh, the different for the online exhibition uh, regarding the Burma past uh, about the difference of the online and the offline exhibition. I just uh, touched earlier that you have uh, considered about the, the knowledge about Burma and then you put the basic information so that the audience know about Burma. And how about the online? Do you include that also or any other different uh, factor or information that different from the online and offline? Absolutely, uh, we did. Uh, from easy things like for the online exhibition, just the online, there's a full transcript, so you can print that out. Um, we also included a timeline, uh, which we thought would be really useful for people who are trying to really understand Burma. And if you look at the timeline, I think we start with the founding of, um, I'm gonna say it wrong, because we have, I haven't looked at this in a while, but um, Archon, Archon, so the, the, we try to go back as far as we can without confusing people. Uh, and we, we argued about that a lot. And for the online exhibition, we actually broke it up into more parts. I think, I think even you mentioned there are five chapters. 
really looking to make the um, the journey of citizen to outcast clear. Um, also, part of that, um, we did a few things for the online exhibition. One, breaking it up into more pieces, providing really clear uh, subheads, subtitles, which by the way, you can link to online. So we wanted to make sure that the online exhibition could be shared in sort of small nuggets because different parts, we expected different parts of the history to become really relevant at different, based on what's happening in the world. That's certainly what we've experienced with um, other exhibitions that we've done. And what else do we do differently? The films are for the most part the same. And I believe we have more personal stories online, mm. but very few people are reading the personal stories. So that's kind of sad. Uh, and then lastly, in museum, I mean, all of us have been to museums and the beautiful thing about a museum is that you kind of, you walk into an experience, it's, it's all around you. It's like, it's walking in, I mean, it is, you're walking into a box, right? Uh, but we get to control everything from the temperature that you feel to the lighting, to what you're looking at, what you're experiencing. Uh, it's such a unique mm. moment. I mean, it's why we all go to museums. And so while we're telling the same story, we did it very differently. Thank you. Could you come and see it? Yeah. Uh, could you share more about the um, uh, the the point, the significant point that we should take into into consideration about the um, what you what you think or what the part that have to uh, be considered for the uh, difference between the online and offline. Because uh, I'm very interested in this uh, online since it's new, it um, it's new, so it's um, a bit uh, challenge also to uh, have this exhibit to post it online. So we can make we want to make sure that how people or the audience can get information, interested, and like kind of give an enough impression for them, so that they can get more information also. So uh, the, this may answer your question. Um, we really had to limit the amount of information that we included for the online exhibition. We chose the story that we were going to tell and we told a story. Uh, mm -hmm. Other places have long articles about Burma, which is what some people wanted us to do. And we really had to push back and say, no, this is an exhibition. This is for the general public. And it is as much information as we believe one person is going to read on a screen. We broke it up so it would be easy to read. And it's not that in depth. Exhibitions aren't that in depth because they're not research papers. They're not um, historical essays. They, for the experts, which many of you on this call are, um, they can be frustrating because you want to say, but, but why didn't you include, I mean, we, and we asked people to say, well, but no, we need to include this whole event or um, we argued about how many photos and the digital team really pushed back. You'll see when you go through it um, that you're looking at in any section where there are multiple photos, I think there are never more than five. And generally speaking, there are only three or four. People aren't gonna look at seven or 10 photos. They're, they're just not, they're not. Um, and so the curator would say, no, 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 no. You have to add these other five, but no one's gonna see them. And adding five more photos is work for somebody because we have to clear copyright. We have to write captions. We have to then, um, for anyone who's worked you know, online or in a museum, working with a photo, that's a bunch of work and you're gonna do it five times or 10 times. So there was a lot of um, reducing 
with sticking with the idea that less is more because we always wanted to include more. Yes, th yeah, thank you. I think it's um, what you, you uh, raised just now is very important that you think about the consideration about the general audience and not much about the historical essay. So uh, should be more image than, and film and also personal story. This is, uh, thank you for sharing. Oh, of course. And um, feel free to reach out if you want to talk more about it. Thank you, Sayana. And I think on the chat, we have one more question from Vietnam or comment. So I would like to invite to ask directly. Please, uh, any question from Vietnam? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, um, thank you for everyone. And I'm glad to be here. And uh, let me introduce a little bit more about myself and what is going on back in Vietnam. Uh, my name is Ibim, and I was born in the Central Highland into the Rade Trap. And I've been the living before, during, and after the Vietnam War. And I was trained as the medical professor back in Vietnam. And today, because of the political reason, I escaped. And now I'm America as refugees. And so the atrocity, what occurs, uh, we are ethnically, geographically, linguistically, and culturally completely different uh, from the main group Vietnamese. And we have uh, enduring the long period, more than 20 years in the Vietnam War. And today is uh, more than 46 years uh, under communist rule. And that means is that we have a struggle from with the war, communism, capitalism, and now is the, we are perfect, complete. And I believe that we no longer exist because all the story, missing image in the Vietnam War, not to reflect someone else. For instance, we are specific people and we have been existing for many central central theory, but now is the cultural language, identities, everything is complete, it's gone. So that is mean we are perfect victim of the genocide. And if the inspiring with the Raphael Lankin, the conception on the genocide is as a destruction of the essential of the human group life and the United Nations Convention, that is the com put the comparative on the, the how the situation is nearly fit. But however, we are not recognized as the victim of a genocide. And now is the when we see it, everything in the Southeast Asia, from Cambodia, from Myanmar, and then when we, I'm trying to invite myself to study in the literature of genocide and then bring up this idea and most people turn up. So, and now I'm glad to see in the Western DC display exhibit all the, the atrocity of the genocide. And something is big in the human history in Vietnam war that are, we are missing picture. So my question is the, how the museum Holocaust in Washington DC can bring this image missing genocide in the Vietnam war, particularly in the Rade people like us to in the memory of the history of the humankind. That is the, my main question. Any help from the, because we are actually directly with the Vietnam War and something missing picture. That, that, is, is, a that is a challenging question because there are, there are never again, is not yet a reality, not in Vietnam, not in Myanmar, also places in South America where we are not 
you're not currently active. So that is the question of how do we prevent and then how do we make people aware? So right now we're focusing on the Rohingya to see if we can assist there. Um, and I hope that we'll also be doing some work in China, which is a whole nother problem. Yeah. I am. Um... And I have a last question. So like uh, we are a group in America now, and uh, we try to bring this image in the Vietnam War because the most uh, rugged people in our Montreal, the, the image uh, understanding about us uh, through the image of the soldier American Vietnam War, and that is not complete with the reality. So how can we, 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 we make contribution with the, in term when the Holocaust is never again, or I mean the outcast need to be written in history and how can we, we connect it with the museum to bring this uh, missing about true history about genocide? I think the best answer I have for you right now is I don't know because there are multiple genocides or mass atrocities. I think everyone here knows when we use the term genocide, there is the legal definition, which is one which is important to many countries. And then there is the common understanding of genocide when it has not been declared legally. In some cases, it's considered a mass atrocity. Um, I know we're getting into legal terminology here. Uh, and how do we how do we continue to talk about all of the different events in which people have turned on another group and why? And that's really where we spend our time is the understanding how the othering, the dehumanizing that can allow one group to determine that another group does not have the same rights or may not have rights to their language or their culture or land, or education, or healthcare, or possibly not even the right to life, which is the extreme. Not a satisfying answer, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you for answer. Welcome. Um, I, saw, next, I saw another oh, hand. Uh, sorry, Anna, mm -hmm, please, Anna, the next question. Sarah, you have just answered my question because I wanted also to ask you about how often your visitor ask about the similarity and the differences between the situation of Jews under the Nazi era and the situation of Rohingya. And how do you deal with the ethic issues connected with the comparison between the Holocaust and the Rohingya genocide? Oh, I love that question. Because um, it's not only that one, we also, we've had exhibitions in the past on uh, Rwanda. Uh, we've had films on the Yazidi uh, and then the most recently Rohingya. And there's so many similarities. So we don't point it out. We hope, we, our hope is that through the storytelling, the light bulb will go on. People will have that aha moment of, oh my goodness. This is, this is not so different. The Holocaust was in the 1930s and 40s. And this is, well, this is now, um, although it started kind of in the 60s and 70s, but this is now. And it's not, it's different. And that it uses social media instead of radios. It's different that the people are in Southeast Asia and not Germany, but it's not that different. And so we don't, we don't make it explicit. We look to tell the story in such a way that people will make the connections. And we have found that we do not, we, we don't have to explicitly state that there is a similarity. They figure it out, which I guess I hope is good storytelling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Any other questions? Okay, Sanjoy, and please. You can go ahead first. Now, please ask if you have a question. Uh, well, I, yeah, 
Well, I wonder that, as you mentioned, that this, this term, the genocide, is not a very legal for, 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 for many purposes, for many, many, many ways. So, uh, in, in, like, you know, obviously, we all know that uh, Myanmar is not agreed that this term, the Rohingya genocide, but right now, it's still, it's still today. So, in your museum, so when you're storytelling to others, I mean, this, this, uh, you know, so I do introduce this term genocide as a Rohingya genocide for them. So, we are very specific. Yeah. Yep. There, um, there are events of mass atrocities. There was one specific event that I believe has been deemed a genocide. And we are, um, this is why there's so many reviews of all of our exhibitions and our materials. We're looking to be accurate. And in some cases that can be frustrating to the general public, frustrating to perpetrators, frustrating to the victim groups. And it is a, an accuracy line that we walk. So, uh, so that's what we do. There was, um, and mass atrocity is much more broad. We spend much more time with that term until something has been deemed a genocide, which is now the legal term. Um, Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yep. So, Sayana, you asked a question here about what is significant for. Um, what's significant for a curator or presenter to take into account? Uh, I want to touch on that. One is yes, finding please. a one is um, finding a one determining your audience and the outcomes so that you guys can agree on that or argue about it. Uh, but the other one is really determining who the curator is. But I wouldn't allow them to be the all powerful, they have to have a designer and a storyteller who is their partner. Because we found that curators want to tell really long story, they want to include everything, and they need a partner who can help them to stay focused. That was, we um, find that all the time. So you mean that the curator and also the designer also uh, should be together? Yes. Or the, the, um, the, how to say, the person who, who owns the story, how they want to tell? Because mm -hmm. the curator will always want to tell more. They want to tell a big story and a designer needs to help them stay focused. Like You need to figure that out, who is who is staying focused, who owns the story or who agrees on the story. We would share the story and where we were with a group of three museum advisors, a little bit of, of um, behind the scenes work there so that um, someone who was just coming in and looking at our work every like six weeks could provide some insights and kind of remind us that perhaps we'd gone a little, little too deep. Thank you. Helpful. Yeah, I think yeah, there will be um, need to discuss for among the group. Like we cannot decide only uh, one person or two two person need to have the participant from participation from different angle of the of the work. Yeah, from the work. Yeah, thank you. Some other questions, uh, if we have, and I also have one question to, to Sara. Uh, so we all know how uh, digital space impacted the narrative storytelling. And I would like to ask Sara for this particular exhibition we are talking about, about Birma, but also other exhibitions. What are the main, uh, like, um, what kind of interactive um, uh, approaches do you use? Uh, to engage the audiences online specifically on such sensitive topics and what you would recommend to others, for example, uh, doing digital exhibitions. We do very few interactives, meaning uh, and meaning something that like you can play with it or you touch it and it starts to move around on its own. Uh, and they're, um, I love interactives, they're so much fun. They are. The challenge that we have is that we expect our exhibitions online to be used for anywhere from five to 10 years. 
and updating interactives because technology changes, it, there's a high cost of ownership. So when I'm looking at an interactive, the question is what's the best way to tell the story? Hello. Um, what's the best way to tell the story? If it's an interactive and that really is gonna do the trick, we're all in. Uh, but there are very few moments where an interactive is going to be the best way because then it really needs to be tested, right? It has to work, not technically. Of course, it has to work technically. We all know that. It has to work for the audience. And I am fairly certain that everyone on this call has used an interactive and used it a bunch of times to try and figure out what exactly is this interactive trying to tell me? Also, everything, we want to make sure that everything worked really well on the phone, which again, limited interactives. Uh, we were very much, we wanted the Rohingya community to see the work that we had done to tell their story. That, that was important to us. Um, in other exhibitions, we have done interactives and they just, they take a lot of design time. The coding part actually wasn't the most difficult. It was really ensuring that a visitor any one of us would look at it and go, oh, I understand, like, like the light bulb goes off. Oh my God, I, I totally understand what you mean by immigration quotas or losing citizenship or whatever story an interactive is gonna tell. And we know that people print out stuff on our websites. So if it's something that needs to be printed, uh, like the timeline, um, interactives don't print. So that's something else that we've taken into consideration. Uh, thank you very much. And I think there is one more question from Esther from uh, Myanmar, please, Esther. Um, hello. Uh, so I have kind of my question is a bit more, uh, I don't know how to put exact word, but I will try to uh, ask because I'm not from the background of museum. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like to visit museum, but I'm not like working specifically on those uh, sector. So just, but usually, you know, like in general, when we consider about uh, museum or specifically for like never again of genocides or, or these crimes, we usually consider this is about the past event, right? So we go and learn about the past event and we try to think like, never again and it's kind of the justice the memorialization wow. stuff something mm -hmm. and so but this is ongoing right now ongoing so how but on the other hand we already said that genocide in terms of it is in as an event or is a progress right a process not sorry not progress it's just a process so so how do you like as a, as a zero knowledge about museum, how do you kind of uh, put uh, focusing on the, the, the concept of never again with the, the continuously ongoing uh, crime? So, so like, how, how, yeah, it's, it's that's a good like, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that is one, and sorry, the second question is I'm very curious to know, like because you also mentioned you have been best best things with like you know the, the Rohingya community as well as other community uh, from Myanmar. So I'm just curious to know what's the response uh, uh, from different community as well as from the Rohingya community. Thank you. Okay, so um, so I'll say what we did for Rohing for the Rohingya exhibition for Burma's Path to Genocide. Uh, so we have it in three rooms, which we consider three chapters. Um, Citizen to Outcast was chapter one. Chapter two is 2017, very specific, mass atrocity, um, completely depressing, absolutely beautiful display. And I will say that is one of the things that we do. It's like the history that we tell is so awful that we make everything beautiful. Like that's the contrast, because otherwise, how could you possibly walk through this history? And um, I would say the Jewish Museum in Moscow actually does a very similar approach. Uh, and then that third chapter, we make it that we try to make it very clear that this is unfinished business. 
hasn't ended. No one knows where their lives are going to go. It's sort of, um, it's life suspended for the Rohingya. And then there has been no justice. And we wanted to make sure the ending was there because we didn't want to be updating it with, you know, where do things stand today? Because things in Burma are changing quite a bit. Uh, so that was what we did for that specific moment, which was, this isn't over. Nobody knows how it's going to end. Justice hasn't happened yet. And then um, the two perpetrators finally appear, or who we consider the perpetrators. The responsible parties, how about we call them that? Um, so that was one piece. Your other question, that's how we dealt with, with never. The other one is like never again is continuing to be never again. And I don't know how we do. We can't like be the museum of the future. We also don't, I don't want to excessively depress people when they come to the Holocaust Museum. There are already enough people who don't come because like, oh, can't do the Holocaust. Uh, so we have looked at a variety of ways to tell the story of Never Again, showing one, the policy work that has happened both in the United States and globally, and then the sort of the mass atrocities and genocides that have been happening. And we actually did some designs for that. And we had to step back. It's like, what, what are we trying to achieve here for the general public? We've been looking at how we might do an exhibition on like the evolution of dehumanization, sort of those things that we as general public do, how as an ordinary member of society, how we can change over time in ways that we become onlookers, bystanders, witnesses of, um, of the early warning signs. So what does it mean to create a healthy society? Those are questions that we talk about. We have not done an exhibition on any of that. Um, we've, we've made a few stabs at it and then we've, we've stepped back. I hope that answers your question. And the other piece is how many genocides or mass atrocities haven't happened because of the UN, because of agreements in the EU, like you can't measure a negative. The same thing or have more wars been prevented, war being one of the opportunities that provides cover for mass atrocities and genocide. There have been fewer, there, I think there were fewer wars in the 20th century than in other centuries before, but you can't, none of us can prove that, that somehow um, actions on the, um, on the global scale have actually made the world a better place in terms of war and death, I don't know. Someone else would like to ask something, Rafael, I think you wanted to ask also. Well, I, I am happy to go last. So if there is anybody else, I'm, I'm happy, happy to wait. If there are no other uh, comments or, or questions, I am happy to, um, to ask mine. Um, no, I, I really appreciate your presentation, Sarah, I, and I think uh, especially the way you, you, you talked uh, about the challenges rather than uh, anything else. I, I think this is, this is really valuable. Mm. And uh, I guess my, my question uh, is, well, I, I, I probably have two questions rather than one. Uh, one is about uh, the, the, the backlash. Have you received any, which would probably amount to, uh, you know, minimization or trivialization of um, of, of of the Rohingya genocide? Uh, I imagine that happened, but 
if you could uh, share with us uh, some some information about it that would be uh, that would be very very useful and uh, And, and, and secondly, I have a question uh, about a bigger issue that you um, you alluded to already, and you actually you know you, you spoke about it already. But uh, I, I I just wanted to to ask it directly. Was it a big decision for the for the um, for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to have a to have an exhibition about the contemporary genocide of the Rohingya. I could oh. imagine it was not an easy decision and 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 I think th there is always a lot of pressure on institutions like yours on organizations like the Never Again Association you, you know why do you or do you not address this or that issue, which is uh, uh, which is ongoing, and I think it's actually quite justified. It, it's, it's good pressure. Um, it, so, it is actually legitimate, uh, but I wanted to ask you for 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 your own perspective on 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 that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to bundle your first question about was there backlash because Esther, I think Esther asked a question about what did other communities in, in Burma, how did they react? In fact, how did the um, expat Rohingya community react? And what we were told, and some groups saw it in person, and they saw our work as it was evolving. Because we didn't want to like, here, it's all done. What do you think? Like that, we, like that, first of all, that would be really expensive to start undoing things and demoralizing for all of us. So from that perspective, all along the development of the exhibition from our selection of images, script, voices, approach, uh, what we heard from the Rohingya, we also had members of the Rakhine community and uh, was that, and, and let's be honest, we had people who were friendly to the story, right? Uh, that they felt that we had, that we had treated the story um, appropriately. They felt recognized, they felt heard. Um, they did not feel in any way trivialized. And so that's part of what we were really looking for. Also, it's, um, it's a very different culture from, are we choosing the right colors? Like we had all sorts of, like we didn't even know what, what, what we might be getting wrong. So that was really important to us um, to avert a backlash that could be averted to your question, Rafael. Um, the other question of a political backlash, we, we do have a division in, um, at the museum called the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide. They worked in Syria, Rwanda, I believe they've done work in Cambodia, South Sudan, Iraq, uh, and they work with policymakers and they were a partner in creating this. So certainly in terms of what reactions we might receive from the policy community, they were with us from the beginning. They're also one of the reasons why we did this exhibition and because of the work that we have been doing in with the Rohingya, and we've been doing work on, on what's been happening there now for, for many years. Uh, we also did work in Syria. We did an exhibition about Syria. So it's another sort of warning signs that you can see and, and mass, mass flight. Uh, we did another exhibition, it's a small one, about refugees, uh, Iraqi, Iraqi refugees in Germany, where you could um, have a, con a real time conversation with a translator with a refugee who had left Syria or Iraq and was now in Germany. So we've been for the last 
I think more than 10 years now, looking at contemporary themes that show that never again is not yet a reality. However, to your point, we don't step into it lightly. Uh, we are a Holocaust museum first. Uh, and if you look at this, the, just the sheer space of our physical institution, this exhibition of uh, 7,000 square meters, is that what I said, um, is, is just a small sliver of our physical plant. So you can see the difference in terms of Holocaust is this big, contemporary genocide is this big. And then online, um, we have case studies for policymakers, journalists, and students about multiple countries, uh, genocide or mass atrocities there, and then the, um, the building early warning signs of sort of what happened, it's all history, right? So you're looking back, like sort of we should have known or you could have seen or people did see and nothing happened. So that is why contemporary genocide, much smaller. We do have a division that is really focused on making never again um, a reality. They used to be called the Committee on Conscience and they are part of our founding. So we do view that as part of our, part of our mission to make one to do for those who are, um, for those who are at risk, what no one did for the Jews in Europe to raise the alarm and then perhaps to make never again a reality, in which case we could just close up shop, we'll be done. Uh, that would be great. It's not gonna happen because humans are humans. And we haven't seen a backlash yet, but no one's paying attention. It's COVID time, our museums, like we, we usually, in our peak season, we have eight, six to 8,000 people a day walking through our doors. Today we have 800. 70 people a day are seeing our exhibition. Like, I, I don't know when that's going to change. I don't know what the Delta variant's going to do. Um, and at least in US society, there's so much more for us to argue over. No one's paying, no one's paying attention. We do have a policy event planned soon, maybe. We'll see what happens there. But come back and ask me in April next year when life has returned to normal. I do hope that we've done enough that if there is a backlash, it is not because we got anything wrong. It's because someone has another, um, a larger agenda that they find us convenient to use. It's not a problem that we created for ourselves. For those, did I answer your questions? Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank okay. you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. And some other questions from some other participants, uh, also those who joined us later. And I shared uh, in, in the chat uh, the link to visit the exhibition. So you are all welcome. It's online version. So if you have any other comments from other participants to our speaker. So thank you very much, uh, dear Sarah, for agreeing to, to have our, this meeting with us today. I think it was very interesting because we uh, covered many different aspects of your work at the museum, very important work at the museum. And I know that some of the participants, they visited the museum and some of them, they didn't visit the museum. So, But they want to visit, so they joined us today. And it was interesting to learn how to you create this online um, exhibition, what are the challenges and how it impacted the narrative uh, as we all try to adapt to the situation. And we are also have doing a lot of things online. So it's very, very interesting and useful uh, meeting. And I hope we can meet in some time again uh, with passing of some time so we can learn what was the reaction on the exhibition, what is happening next, what is the progress. So thank you very much. And if you have something to say to us, the last things, uh, which we didn't ask, but you would like still to share. So you have a couple of more minutes. So please tell us. I'd really just like to thank you, Natalia, for having me. And it's really an honor to be asked. And it's always a pleasure to talk about our work, share what we're doing. Um, you guys asked some tough questions. 
gotten me thinking, which is, um, I really appreciate. So, so many thanks. Um, you have my email, please reach out when you come to the United States. We'd love to give you a tour of both Burma's Path to Genocide and our main exhibition. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you also other participants and we will be staying in touch and the video will re is recorded. So we will also have notes in addition to the recording to share with you and we will be in touch about our next meeting. So thank you very much and thank you uh, to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Very sorry, I did I late because I have a class. So I applied for my late. Actually, we have a requirement subject. So that's why I have to join my class. So hopefully, next time we'll be joined and miss everyone. So thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye, everyone. Good to see you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good to see you. bye, -bye.